Bandwidth for ChangeLog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. Error monitoring is provided by Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. I'm Bill Kennedy, and it's now go time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. Everybody. I'm Carlicia, and today we have as a guest Bill Kennedy. I am so glad for the show today. Bill, give us a little bit of introduction about yourself. Uh, so many people know about you, but you know there are more and more new people coming on to the Go community, and some of them are not going to know who you are. So tell us about the rock star that you are. Oh, rock star. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I found my way into Go back in 2013. I um, own a company named Arden Labs with my best friend, brother, and business partner, Ed Gonzalez, down in Miami. And in 2013, we had to switch off of Windows and move into a, a Linux environment. I was coding a lot of C Sharp at the time, and that's when we found Go, and I started writing some blogs. and. Eric and Brian, the other hosts on the show, invited me to um, join them in, in writing the Go in Action book. And that led to talking at the very first GopherCon. And then between the blog and the book, I started developing training material. And um, probably started training at the end of 2015. And now it's pretty much a full-time job day in and day out. And I still make it a point to write one blog post every month on uh, the goandgo.net blog, which we've now moved over to um, Arden Labs, but everything gets redirected. And so I'm really just a software developer who's been writing software professionally since 1991. And um, I've been working in Go for almost five years. That's an amazing track record. Um, <laughs> your, your book is very famous. Your blog posts are fantastic. And your Twitter account is super active and also very insightful and very oriented towards Go. So for people who are new to Bill Kennedy, make sure to look through the show notes and get the info, info of how to find him online. And what are we going to talk about today? I thought it would be fun to talk a little bit about um, the, some challenges and 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 maybe some advice around learning and teaching Go. One of the things I do at the beginning of every one of my classes, I teach a lot of um, two, mostly three-day classes. Um, and I'm teaching a lot of these classes because companies are having a hard time, obviously, finding Go developers that already have a, a few years of experience, right? I mean, the language is still new. And so I think companies are doing the right thing. They're hiring smart devs who want to learn Go. Uh, and then my training classes are really giving everybody about an eight to 12 month kind of head start or jump. And one of the things I tell every developer in the room, as I, as I say, as we go through this material for the next three days, I need you to wear two hats. I need you to wear the student hat. Here you are, you're learning Go. And, and you know, I want to be effective in that way. But at the end of the day, you're also going to be teaching Go, whether you like it or not, because the next round of developers that you hire are probably going to be trained and I'm not going to be brought back in this room. It's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be on you. So I also ask people to look at the material that I'm teaching, not just as a student, but as someone who's also going to have to teach it. Uh, and I thought that would be uh, an interesting thing to talk about today. How do people respond to that? Do they welcome the, the, the proposition of taking on the role of teacher because developers don't really see themselves that way. If I can speak for every single developer in the world, um, you know, we do code reviews, but like being a teacher, being a mentor is a big deal. I'm just wondering if people are like, oh yeah, definitely I'll be teaching people. Well, I, I think effective code reviews are teaching and I think answering questions 
it, it's all a form of teaching if it's not necessarily formal in front of the classroom. But I think what this does also in the classroom setting is it allows the more experienced developer to focus more on the material, even if they feel like they know it already. Because it's one thing to know something, and then it's another thing to know it well enough to be able to teach it. And vocabulary is huge here. And so I ask those, especially more experienced developers, to listen to the words I'm using. Look, look at how I'm presenting the material. And I think it also, it helps in the classroom environment to take that person who's probably feeling they're more experienced, maybe they know some of this stuff, and it gives them that opportunity to really focus on it in, in, in a teaching sense. So I you know people, I think, get it, and, and, and it really helps with focus in the classroom. Yeah, so I, I've been in your training, and uh, because you also give free trainings for underrepresented uh, communities, uh, including women like me, and I have also read your awesome blog posts, and I really love how you focus on the meaning of the words and on the fundamentals, because I think that really capacitates people to be better at understanding the concepts. I mean, you, you do have to understand the concepts beyond understanding the syntax and what how to do things. Um, so you can be more effective. I mean, if you do, you'll be a lot more effective and you, and you can effectively do code review as a mentor, as opposed to just pointing things wrong, pointing out, you know, what can be improved, but it's also like how and discuss trade-offs and things like that. So I, I love this approach. And um, before we dive, into more specifics of that. I also wanted to ask you if you see, are there people actively teaching Go? Because I don't see that. It's not on my radar, but not that I'm looking for it either. I'm just, I just wanted to get a sense of like, I think we need more teachers out there, no? No, I mean, we could use a lot of teachers out there. I think the demand is there. And, um, you know, Mark Bates and Corey Lanou are doing a lot of training. Um, I think what Mark has built in terms of Buffalo is really important for the community, right? It's it's going to be basically what Ruby, what Rails is for Ruby. I'd like to see a lot, some some editor integrations um, on Buffalo to make it even more. So Mark is out there teaching that. I think it's important. Corey's teaching a ton of stuff too. Um, and, you know, I was just talking, uh, I was in India last week and I was just talking to Sean Kelly, who everybody knows, knows him as Stabby. And, He's going to um, potentially be doing some training as well. And 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 Sean's amazing. Um, wait till you see his talk from India. Uh, amazing job. And so I'm really, we definitely need more teachers. And, and, and again, from my perspective, it doesn't necessarily have to be formal teachers in the classroom. I mean, every single person who answers a question, whether it's on Slack, on Reddit, on the mailing list, in the, in the office is, is teaching. So for me, it's about being an, an accurate and effective teacher, at, 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 you know, every time you do it. My biggest fear as a teacher is not being accurate. This is what I've really worked hard over the last, say, three or four years. It's, it's trying to make sure that everything that's, that I'm saying is, is accurate. I'm not misleading someone. Absolutely. It's, um, you know, you can teach something and then you can teach it properly. It makes all of the difference. But yeah, I mean, you know, we counting on our fingers here, the number of teachers, and I wonder, you know, is there not a market or we just, we're just missing that ability to, to capacitate teachers. But in any case, let's move on to talking about what does it mean for you to teach? And let's get into, dig into the, those details. Yeah, I, I guess if, I feel like I've, I've been teaching my whole life, whether it was tech, or or other things. And I guess I have to say I have a passion for, for being up there and, and helping people grow um, in their careers and, and in their life, right? I mean, I've been blessed with so much and to, to be able to give that back is amazing. And then be able to make a living off of it's even crazier, right? Which is also why I try to do as many free events um, as I can. Um, but um, I just think it is if we're gonna if we're gonna have a better go community, right? We've we've got to have people out there that are willing to give their time and effort to to make everybody better. Sometimes somebody will come to me and they'll say, 
oh, I'm so exhausted. I see so much bad code out there and, and it's driving me crazy. And I, and I have to remind people that out of the entire lifetime of, of code written in Go, out of the entire lifetime of code that's ever going to be written, let's say over the next 10 or 15 years, we, we've written such a small percentage of it at this point that we have this huge opportunity to make sure that, that the next two or three years of code is so much better um, than the last. So, you know, I just have this passion to make sure that people are being, and what's really important is that people are just being successful, using the language, they're building product, they're getting into production. They're not getting to a point where they're like, let's, we have to replace this with another language or this isn't working or we put some walls. Um, because I love working in Go and, I, and I'd like to uh, finish my career doing it. I mean, I, I, I'd like to retire in the next, you know, five to eight years. And, um, I, you know, I'd like to make this like really the last programming language that I use professionally. And, you know, um, before people start thinking that you are being an expert teacher and being picky about uh, a, the proper way to write code, I want to bring up this talk that Dave Cheney gave in London at the Golang UK conference in 2016. Um, it was uh, something about design patterns. Uh, we will have it on, on the show notes. Um, but he, the message of his talk was, in this moment in time, we who are doing uh, developing in Go, whether it's open source or proprietary software, it doesn't matter. We are setting the tone for the success of the language in the future. Because if we write it properly and efficiently and using idioms the way they're supposed to be used, to take advantage of the efficiency of the compiler, et cetera, then the projects done using Go are going to be successful. And that's just going to generate more um, desire for people to pick up the language and, and use in new projects. Now, of course, the opposite, you could say that the opposite would be true. If we just write whatever codes, projects will be hard to maintain and then Therefore, it diminishes the chances of Go being successful, which to us who know Go is a shame because Go is, so, is, is such a pleasant language to work with. I mean, people have different uh, preferences for, for why Go is awesome to them, but in general, there are a lot, of, a lot of benefits that people really like. We discuss this all the time here on the show. We don't need to go over it in this episode. With that said, in the name of the talk is uh, Solid Go Design. It's really worth watching. With that said, I would like you to talk about what is the big deal when we say, how is it even possible that there is so much bad code written in Go? Because one thing that we keep saying about Go is that Go is so simple to write. With, with something that's so simple to write, how can there be uh, you know, opportunities for, for writing such bad code? It's like, I don't get it. I get it. But if I was you know, an outsider and not used to um, seeing Go codes, I'd be like, how, how can you mess this up if you, want, on one hand, you claim it's so simple? And um, yeah, so please tell us more about that. So I, I think let's define what we mean by bad, first of all, because it's a really open-ended term. And I think when we say bad, we pro, for me, let's say we mean that it's not idiomatic. Okay. And this is a word that I almost, I, I don't like this word anymore. I think there was a time in the Go community where we got a little overzealous about code having to be idiomatic to the point where um, I don't think as a community we were um, <sighs> being flexible enough where, from where people were coming. And one of the things that I teach extensively is in the beginning, I don't want you to get hung up on idiomatic. I want you to get things to work and strive to improve your understanding of what are the best practices for the next piece of code you write. Because that's so important. If you come to the language and you can't get things to initially work, you're, you're going to walk away. 
And so I think one of the big problems we have is we've been trained from university over the last 20 something years to leverage object oriented principles and design. And in the languages that we've been using up until Go, that's exactly what we should have been doing. And though we could spend an entire show talking about is Go an object oriented programming language, uh, one of the things that I try to push is we don't want to leverage object-oriented principles and design while we're writing code in Go. For me, it's all about data-oriented design, and it's something that I focus pretty heavy on in the class. And so I think when we say code is bad, again, I think we're saying it's not necessarily idiomatic, and who can write idiomatic code day one? And then from my perspective, it's probably, and what I see the most is, People taking what they know, which is what you're going to do, okay, and applying that idea into Go because this is what you what you know, and a lot of it's object-oriented programming, and people are going to be successful day one, and then hopefully the ideas are going to come back and they're going to go, okay, that worked, and I got a program that's working. I, I did the same thing in my very first Go software, but over time, we're learning that um, these aren't really the design principles that, that we want to carry forth as we move on. Um, and I think that this is what we're what we're really saying when we say, um, you know, all the code is we look at code and it's bad. But what I'm really hoping is over time people can because Go is going to cause you to have to do and think about some things that just packaging alone. Right. Like Packaging alone took me a long time to to really understand in terms of project design and structure. Take, it takes a long time and we don't have any true consensus right now as a community on how to do that. And I'm not sure we ever will because encapsulation has been a problem as an industry for forever. Right. And I've got my ideas and Ben Johnson's got great ideas and other people have great ideas. Like for me, I'd love to see more people talking about packaging and, and what's working for, and what's not working for them. I'm sorry. I think I have... you mean. Go ahead. No, no, I think I think I think that's what we mean. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you on the aspect of um, focusing on Go idioms. That drove me absolutely crazy when I started learning Go because you know everybody was like it, whoever was talking about uh, learning or teaching Go was talking about e Go idioms, and I'm like, what are the idioms? And the the, the general answer was like, do you know where you'll see it? You'll know when you see it. <laughs> <laughs> because there is isn't like there now there are some websites out there that go over the some some of the idioms or all of the idioms and it's great and we have the proverbs which is a great guideline for the philosophy of go and but so you were saying just jump in start doing it i also agree with that because i am horrible i like i need to know before i do it and then i never do it so i i'm that's some, something that i'm working on too just like just get something done and then iterate and get it better. Now, if you, if someone follows your advice and just starts getting th things done, what is the next thing they should look at if, for them to improve? So you're saying data oriented design, you, you're talking about package. What really should it be, they should it be the very first thing for people to look to learn? I, I think, uh, so there's this quote, there's this quote from um, Tom Love, who's the inventor of Objective C. I, I, I mentioned this quote in every single class, and I, I have always found it to be pretty profound. And he, and he said, the software business is one of the few places uh, where we teach people to write before we teach them how to read. And it's kind of mind blowing when you think about it, because if you and I've got a ton of other quotes. And if you read quotes about how to write good, effective software, we talk about invariance or understanding cost. We talk about um, code reviews. We talk about writing tests. We talk about all of these things that, from my perspective, are driven from being able to read code, not necessarily write code. And I think if you really want to be a better software developer in general and, and a better developer for a particular language, I think the ability to read code, understand the impact that code is having, understand, be able to visualize that code, is going to help you write code better. And for me, the idioms of the language are really about allowing you to take 
full advantage of what that language is trying to provide you. You know, and it's not, again, you're going to get things done, but I think the question you have to ask, whoever you can ask it is either, how would you have done this? Or is there a better way to do it? Now that you have a working solution, it's like, okay, I have a, I have a frame of reference on how to improve that. And one of the things I, and nobody takes advantage of this, to be honest with you, and now I'm on a podcast, so I'll be flooded, but um, Satish, who who runs the um, the India um, conferences a few years ago did this thing called the go challenges and there's nine of them out there I'll have a I can give you a link and they were really awesome tasks I mean this wasn't going to take an hour this was going to take people anywhere from a day or two or more and they were really interesting challenges to write and go but what was nice about the go challenges is was and it, it became a scalable because it was hard but People would get a code review, right? And and we would do a code review and it was a contest too. But one of the things that I, I tell people all the time is if you're looking for a project and you're not sure where to begin, then and this is when I'm doing the doing the free classes, um, start with the Go challenges, put that code in a repo because you need code in a repo anyway if you're looking for for work. And I would give everybody a a one code review for everything they're doing. You know, give you like a half an hour to an hour of my time and 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 give you as much feedback as I can on that first one and then go do the second one. And the idea would be that if you did all nine of them, by the time we got to the ninth one, you probably didn't need as much of a review. And I'm talking about more of a readability review, right? Like that's what's so important to me. The readability reviews are more important to me than anything else. That's that's where you begin to start to improve. Um writing writing that code yes absolutely i mean i my go code improved a ton from getting code reviews um when i started working with go so you're saying but you know not everybody has that resource um and i would say also teaching in reviewing other people's code help helps you learn because you have to think about no way am i even what i was thinking was right is it even right now i, I have to check before i actually write it, like tell someone that. Um, but I want to go back to what you were saying about read, read, knowing how to read code. I don't get it. Please explain yourself. Are you talking about, like, what's the big deal? Because I, if I know Go or whatever language, right? If I know the syntax and I read a piece of code, let's say I, I know the syntax, but I'm not well versed in actually programming with it. But I've read a book and I know the syntax enough to read. So I can read. I can read the flow of the code. I can read, you know, this is a function. It's called another, another function. Why are you talking about? What is the big deal with reading codes? What is so hard about it? So for me, we always tell people to write readable and simple code, right? And, and these are buzzwords and they mean different things in different languages. So when I say readable code in Go, this is, this is what I mean. And I teach this in the classes. Uh, and there's two aspects to readability. There's one that's I, I consider more subjective and one that's incredibly measurable. So let's talk about the subjective one. And for everybody listening, I want you to um, put yourself in a mindset for one second. I want you to think about the team that you're working with, the team of people you work with day in and day out on whatever project you're working on. Most For most people, that's anywhere from three to five other people. All right. Well, I want you to think about yourself and all of those people. You got them in your head. OK, good. Now I want you to ask yourself a, 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 a single question. Do you consider yourself to be the average developer on your team? And by average developer, what I mean is that the average developer should be able to comprehend without any issue every line of code that's being written. There shouldn't be anything that's that's clever for that person at all. It, everything is comprehensible. This is why I'm saying it's subjective. So ask yourself, do you comprehend every line of code that's written in the code base that you're working? Are you the average developer for that code base? And then I want you to ask yourself, for everyone around you, and keep it to yourself, obviously, who do you consider to be average? Who do you consider to be less average? Who do you consider to be, to be more average? Because readability has to mean that everybody on the team 
can fully comprehend every line of code that's being written. And if this is not the case, then for that team and that project, you don't have a readable code base. This is also really important because when you're looking to hire somebody, you have to do this evaluation. If you decide that you're going to hire this person and they end up being less than average, then they have a responsibility to come up to speed. You don't have a responsibility to dumb, let's say dummy down, okay, the code for that. They have to come up to speed and that has to be somewhat measurable during code reviews and all that. For me, I think it's easier to hire somebody who may be less than average than more than average because you're asking somebody now to really focus on not being clever. And that can be very, very hard for people. And so sometimes I feel like the person who's above average can, can cause more disruption on a team than maybe somebody who's less than average. The, the less than average developer can, could cause you to have to spend more time in code reviews and teaching. The, the, the person who's less or, or more than average is going to cause you probably more pain in trying to get them to uh, stop being, being clever. So that's, that's number one. Number so that's two, a good, for, just to interject oh, like what you said, like that's a really good point. So you talked about what is readable code. That totally makes sense to me. And, you know, if you're super clever and you start, you know, doing shenanigans, your code is not going to be readable and that is not a good thing. Please go on to well, point number two. You know, it, it's readable for you. And if you're the only one on the project, then there's no issues, right? Yes. It's got to be readable for the entire team. So you, so the team sort of have a sort of a standard, like like we don't go above this line in terms of cleverness and maybe just like keep it very simple, simple to read. If you put me on a on a crypto team, I am way below average, right? Like I've got a lot of work to come up. They cannot be be making the code, let's say, necessarily simpler in certain ways for me, right? Yeah. Um, you put me on a team that's building business APIs. Yeah, I'm, I'm above average there. That's a great a point too, yes. Conscience. Yeah, if you look at code for the standard library, that code is going to look a lot different from, from the code I write, for example, which is a lot of API code. That's a, also a good yeah. point. Yeah. So, so on to uh, point number two. So number two for me is about not hiding costs. Readability is about not hiding costs. It's about writing code whether it's at the line level, whether it's at a function level, where you understand not just what the code is doing, but the impact that code has on the application, on the machine, on, on what you're doing. And this is something I think that Go shines because from a Go perspective, our model is not a virtual machine. It is the real machine. And for a lot of people, this is a whole brand new concept. When, you're, when your programming model is a virtual machine, then we can take a lot of liberties in the syntax, like an object-oriented syntax, let's say, because the virtual machine is there to worry about the mechanical sympathies and to, and to worry about um, the cost of things. But when the real machine is your model, then you have a, a, some level of responsibility to do things um, in a way where we're not hiding cost and that, and you are sympathetic. I mean, the, the compiler and the runtime are amazing at providing layers of simplicity and layers of mechanical sympathy. So the burden of things that we'd had to worry about, let's say in a language like C, go away. But we still have a responsibility to, to write code that doesn't hide cost. Cool. So let's talk about... Um... I have a question for you. For example, in, in, on my team, we have a sub team that's uh, the scalability team. They are going to worry about scalability issues. I don't have so much to worry, worry about that because that's their specialty. I'm not on that team. Now, give me an example of, of hiding, what, uh, what's hiding costs in Go in a specific, uh, and why should I who I work on a, on, a, uh, for a, on a team that has a specific group of people worrying about efficiency, uh, how, what do I have to do um, to be like, you know, write readable, um, 
it code and code that has the attributes that you described, but I'm particularly interested in the hiding cost. What does that mean? Give me an example of what that is and why should I worry about it? So one of the best examples I can show in the classroom is an object-oriented programming language that provides what we call features around constru uh, constructors, destructors, move constructors, copy constructors, and operator overloads, right? Mm -hmm. Languages like C Sharp, Java, C++, they give us the ability to add these constructors and operator overloads. So during the construction of a value, we can do these things behind the scenes with the idea that these are features that the developer or doesn't have to worry about. But if you notice, Go doesn't have constructors and destructors and operator overload. And right. from my personal opinion, I mean, I've never talked to the language team, um, I think it's because these constructs or quote unquote features hide costs. When I look at a variable being, or I look at a value being created, whether it's through a variable declaration or somewhere else, I know exactly what the cost of that line of code is. It's the allocation and and understanding escape analysis, um, well, construction doesn't show you escape analysis. So, but I, I, I understand the cost of that. I know that there's nothing behind the scenes happening that could have really affect my, let's say, decision at the time whether I want to do that or not. And so that's what I mean by hiding cost. If we encapsulate things for the sake of encapsulating to generalize, and we've lost our ability to understand the impact of any given line of code or even any, any function call, we're now hiding cost. I saw somebody, I'll give you a Go example. I was doing a code review and somebody wrote a function that had one line of code in it. And it was a map. They were, it was a map of like string interface, right? So you had this generic map and there was a type assertion that they were doing on the key lookup. And they abstracted that one line of map code with the type assertion because their, their, their answer was that line of code looked too complex and they thought wrapping it in a function would make it simpler. The reality is that what we lost was readability because at the time you look at the function call, you don't really understand the cost of this map call. And the reality is you didn't need the function call. I mean, we're Go developers, show me the map and the, and the type assertion. And that's like an abstraction that's really not providing value. And so when I talk about cost, I wanna make sure that we can look at any line of code and we can and go and have a, a reasonable understanding of the impact that that code is gonna have on the machine, on our application. And it's also writing functions, abstractions that are precise and not generalized. So we can also understand what that encapsulation or abstraction is doing and the impact it's having. Yeah, but I, you know, I get uh, confused with uh, so many different advice and it's hard, like, obviously, I'm just going to say the obvious, it's there are different phases of development, there are different levels of uh, programming, programmer knowledge, and different levels of needs. So what I, what I want to talk about is, for example, at what point, I, I see the benefits of uh, worrying about the cost in the impact on the machine that the language is having, but maybe talk to us a little bit more and then we can move on about at what point do you worry about it? Like as you are writing or do you do an analysis to see where your code is having a negative impact in terms of cost and, and then go from there or do you Think about it all the time as you're writing codes, because we can speak to different, we are speaking to all developers. Uh, at, at least we try to, um, to be a help to everybody, right? So the team, the, the people who are the experts, uh, they're going to know how to do this stuff. They're going to know exactly how to analyze the codes, how to, fix, how to address these issues. And then we have the people who are coming in and we're telling them, just do it, just do it and then move on to the next thing. And then we have, like people which I think are the majority of developers who are neither of those groups and they write in code day, day to day. And then my question to you is, what do you tell those developers? Do, do you tell them to be always on the lookup or on the lookout for those efficiencies and opportunities and how do they learn this stuff? 
So this is the this is what this is when I start getting chills about the language and the engineering behind it. Performance of your Go program is going to come from three places. Okay, we could say that it can come from algorithm efficiencies, right? If you can do something in ten instructions instead of twenty, it's going to be faster. But the hardware is so fast today that you can have levels of inefficiency in your algorithm and still get enough performance. Two, um, garbage collection, right? And, and, and then we've got a low latency garbage collector and we talk about it running under 100 microseconds. The reality is, is that if we're allocating values to the heap that really shouldn't be there, there's gonna be a performance cost to that. Again, we always wanna talk about performance as is it fast enough. Third, um, and Damien did an amazing talk two years ago at .go, it's about how efficiently we can get data into the processor today and um, the mechanical sympathies about that. And if we break these three things down, Go is really pushing us in the right direction for all three if we take some time to just look at what the language is providing and then again, start looking at some, some basic idioms and patterns. So if we talk about what Damien is saying today, that performance today comes from how efficient we can get data into the processor. He's talking about caching systems. If you've noticed, Go basically has three data structures. Arrays, slices, which is an array underneath, right? It's a vector, and maps. And, 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 and the key to these three data structures, and, and maps are doing this underneath, is that it lays data out in a contiguous block of memory. And this is gonna create predictable access patterns, and this is gonna do these things. So the funny thing is, is as a Go developer coming in, the, the, the compiler, right, the language and the runtime have taken care of all of this for you without the need of a big, heavy virtual machine. Just by using a slice to store your data, you're already doing the best thing you can. Um, when it comes to, again, the garbage collector, if we follow some basic idioms around using value semantics for our reference types, then the majority of the values you're creating will stay on your stack. They will not allocate. You don't even have to necessarily understand that all this is happening. And this to me is, is where I get super excited because you can come to this language, follow some basic principles and design and idioms, and you're doing all of these things correct when the machine is your model. And over time, as you learn more and more and more, you start to understand why you're doing this. And that's what I try to do in my class, get you to appreciate why Go has slices and arrays and maps. And so you want to use it for yourself and you understand the brilliance behind that. And we teach escape analysis only so you can appreciate the value and the pointer semantics that the language gives you and effectively use them. And understand that the machine is so fast today that you can have some levels of inefficiency, which mean to me means this. I don't have to write clever code in, in terms of making that algorithm so efficient if, I, if, it, if it's gonna be a little less efficient, but more readable, that's probably not gonna be your bottleneck in terms of performance. So, so let's focus on integrity, readability, and simplicity first. Let's do those readability code reviews first. And then what's brilliant about Go is it says you don't have to guess about performance. We've got a tremendous amount of tooling that will tell you what isn't performing well and give you really clear understandings and indications of where to and how to fix it. And so we don't have to worry about um, necessarily the performance impact on every line of code you're writing at the time you're writing it if you focus on readability, because you're going to get the bulk of it anyway. So it seems to me that you are saying write readable, not avoid cleverness, write readable, try to learn the idioms, and by default, by magic, your code will be efficient. Not by magic, but just by Go's understanding of how everything works. The code yeah, is going to be I am mechanically joking. sympathetic. Oh, yeah, yeah. I am joking. There's no magic in programming. Okay. Well, it feels like magic, but Go is doing a lot of the, of the heavy lifting for you underneath by guiding you in the right direction. Yeah, but my my saying magic, it was more to, as to say this is sounds fantastic. I, it's the lang the engineering behind the language is nothing short of amazing in terms of its ability to 
kind of abstract a lot of the complexity and, and the simplicity that it brings. I mean, just on the concurrent programming side, because I wrote multi-threaded software for a very long time. And, you know, I want to be able to tell everybody, Go has made it easier to write multi-threaded software. It absolutely has. But if you don't, if you didn't have to try to write software with operating system threads directly in the past, you wouldn't really understand what Go has done here. I mean, from a concurrency side of things, what Go has now done is it's taken a huge burden off of me to try to understand how to effectively use threads, depending on the workloads that I'm having. Do I need to use pools? Do I need this? To a point now where I just have to think about what is the work I have to do? And what is the best way to break that work up or to distribute it across the number of threads, in this case, or the number of cores that I have? And let go in the runtime and the scheduler is incredibly intelligent about what code is doing do all the real technical work. It's brilliant. You still have responsibility for dealing with synchronization and orchestration, which is complicated enough. But imagine having to deal with synchronization, orchestration, and then figuring out what's the best way to manage these threads and to run them efficiently. Like It's a huge burden. And, and Go is just continually doing this. And once you start to see what Go is doing here and what you really need to focus on and what you don't, I think this is where that magic that magic comes in, but it's taken me four years to get here. Like this wasn't like day one. I mean, it's taken me four years of study and learning and teaching uh, to see all of this. Yeah, so I'm glad that you are out there sharing that with us and here too. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, you had a, a couple, a few tweets today about, um, you know, about exactly this that we're talking about. And you were saying you are saying that um, you want to focus more on the code that people are writing, and I think it's, you have this this saying about writing good in quotes, good quote, good codes, and also knowing how to read codes. And um, I think if you want, we can move on. But if you have something more to say about how to become a good reader of code, I'm, I'll be super interested in that. How do you teach yourself how to become a good reader of code? Either if you have been programming or if you're new to programming, you know, and especially if you're new to Go, how do you become a good reader of Go code in the specific? Because, because I'm saying this because by what you're saying, you're saying, it will serve you well if you become a good reader before you, you put so much effort into becoming a good writer of, of Go code or in co of code in general. I mean, obviously, you're going to be doing both at the same time, but I, I think it really helps to find people and mentors that can, you know, when you look at a piece of code and it smells good or it smells bad, I mean, we all have that. But the real key then is being able to, do you have a vocabulary to describe why it smells good and bad and, and teach that? But the one thing I've really learned over the last couple of years um, as it relates to uh, this programming language at least is your value and pointer semantics on the data that you're working on is everything. It allows you to understand the impact your code is having on the machine. It allows you to have a consistency with the data because everything you do in a software program is data oriented. It's, they're all data transformations. And if you don't understand the data, you don't understand the problem. And if you don't understand the semantics you're using with that data, are we using value semantics? Are we implementing kind of like immutability around that data? Are we using pointer semantics? Is this thing always shared? You can get lost very quickly around what are my concerns right now as it relates to how I work with this data and the impact it's going to have when I mutate it. So for mm -hmm. me, and I've written a bunch of blog posts on this too, that semantics for me is like key core number one. You learn semantics and you implement, and you implement semantic consistency in the data that you're working with, and, and that can just go such a long way to everything else. Yes, I remember you have a very strong focus on data transformation, right? Like understanding how the data is coming in, what, what is happening to the data, and how you, out, like, you process that data and you output it, and what's going to be done to it later. Like if you focus on that, you're going to understand what code you need to write. Did I say that right? Yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, I, like a classic example for me is the built-in function append. Append is a mutation operation, right? It's going to mutate something about that slice if if we're going to append something to it. There's there's different things that can mutate. And if you notice, you pass a value into append and it returns a value. For me, append is using value semantics, right? It's it's implemented some level of mutability. It's a value semantic mutation API. It could have been designed for pointer semantics, but I, that would have been wrong because we leverage value semantics as it relates to slices. And this is kind of what I mean. It's what I try to teach is you're going to define that type, that data structure you want to work with. And the very next thing you have to do is ask yourself, what semantic are we putting in play here, value or pointer? And then the rest of the API really needs to be driven off of that semantic consistency. Like append is a great example of maintaining consistency with value semantics, even though the API has to mutate things. Mm -hmm. And I think learning that, and I heavily teach that in the classes now, just learning that alone can really make sure that your, your code base is clean, consistent, and I think can grow better over time, especially with, with developer turnover. Do you, so you said you have blog posts that talk, talk about this? I do. I wrote uh, four parts. I, I wanted to talk about this, and I ended up having to write a four-part series that started with how pointers work. Because in order to really understand the semantics, you had to start understanding how pointers work and escape analysis, and then we can get into value and pointer semantics, and then we can get into kind of like design. So there's a right. four-part series there that starts um, with escape analysis and um, that allows me to drive that in. So I'll, I'll send you some links on that too. Yeah, so that's like the second thing you mentioned you're going to give me links for, and I want to make sure that I do get them. So please, um, let's remember. Okay, so what is the next thing we can talk about? Still under the topic of te teaching, I actually, I do have some questions. Um, I don't know if you're done. No, throw, throw. I mean, I don't know how much time we have, but yeah, I'm here. We have about uh, 10, 15 minutes left. Um, so one thing that I, I've known you, Bill, for since I started um, doing anything with Go, which was back in 2015, and I've seen you speak speak at conferences, I've seen you teach classes, and I've seen you just hung out with you at conferences, and the level of stamina you have is absolutely crazy. And um, we are curious to know, how do you keep it up? Do you have a regimen? Do you have, like, is it the water you drink? What is it that you do? Because I want to, you know, I want to get, get me some of the, some of whatever you do. That is funny. So, um, I'm going to be it's honest just, with it, you. I'm sorry, interjection. And the amount of travel you do is just mind boggling. I could never do it. The amount of travel I do is mind boggling. And I don't even know how I do it at all, to be honest with you. Um, over the last six months or so, I've learned um, to take yoga very seriously. I can actually sit on a plane with my legs crossed right now, which helps my back so much. I, you can't even imagine. Um, so I think the yoga has been huge for me as I'm getting older. Um, but, you know, when I'm on the stage or I'm in the classroom, I feel a, a personal responsibility to not just teach, but to entertain people that are there because it's a really long day. Um, and if I get a group that can feed the energy back to me, I could do it all day. When I get a group that is dead and it happens, um, it, it's a it's a struggle. Uh, when, where was I? I was uh, I was in a training. I think at the beginning of the year. I'm not going to say where. And the group was just dead. It was a three day training. I was exhausted by the end of day one. A, even more exhausted at the end of day two because there's no energy coming back at me. And like halfway through day three, I finally just stopped because I couldn't do it anymore. And I just said to the group, I said, you guys are killing me. There's, you're just like straight up, nothing's coming out of you guys. I don't understand what's going on. And they all just kind of turned around to me at the break and they're like, Bill, this is the best training we've ever had. <laughs> and I wanted to strangle them. I'm like, guys, you could have been telling me this. Like I could feed on that energy, you know? And so I think, I think, 
energy from people is is so important. And so if I'm on that stage and I'm and I'm and I'm getting animated or I start animating more in the classroom, it's because I'm trying to, as uh, Florin just said, I'm, I'm trying to be a vampire and 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 take the energy energy out of the room. So I think for the most part, that's how I do it. Now I won't lie, um, having a couple of espressos during the day can really help too. But I need that energy from people, or I I will be as exhausted as as you can imagine. Yeah, I guess it's the espresso. I should drink more espresso. <laughs> <laughs> Not the espresso. You could get like you could start shaking. I, I won't have more than I'll have one in the morning and I'll have one after lunch. I, I I try to keep the espressos down to like to just two. But if I'm in a room that's dead, then I will definitely need another one at some point. So if I walk into your classroom, I need everybody energized and happy and telling jokes and, 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 you know, I know it's me talking for basically seven hours straight for that hour break for lunch, but uh, the more of the interaction, the better. (laughs) There we go. And bring espressos with you. (laughs) (laughs) You got to have an espresso machine as part of the contract. (laughs) Yeah. You know what I'm seeing more and more, Carly? See, those Nespresso machines are showing up more and more in the offices. Oh, my goodness. I'm a trendsetter. Oh. Look at me. Yeah, you are. They, they've they heard it on the podcast and now they're buying them. Yeah. See, I discovered it all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. I have you to thank for it. You know, spend yeah. a ton of money on that machine. Anyway. <laughs> Should we move on to uh, Go Projects in News? Sure. I think you have some stuff to mention. I do. So I was just in India for the, the, Go, the Go conference out there. Uh, very quick backstory. So I met a young man last year named Aman Kapoor. Young man. He was in school. And he wanted to take my training class last year. So um I was fortunate enough to get him into the training class last year. And I got to meet him again this year. And again, he's a student. I think he's in, a, in a, he's in his final year. What's amazing about this young man is he saw a problem at his school where the school is trying to place people in jobs, but all of the information about placement gets lost in this 19, like 90 banner that moves across the screen. And there's no real way to get to the data or interact it. And, and, and Aman built a mobile application with using Go on the back end to, to scrape all of this data. He calls it um, placement pal, to scrape all of this data so the students don't have to like miss anything. They can see all of the opportunities they have for getting jobs. Um, and it's all in one place. And I saw what he built, and I don't think I could have built it. I mean. He built a beautiful like mobile app. It was all browser based, but like for mobile, you know, mobile in it. Amazing. Amazing. So Aman Kapoor, I mean, my I just I'm so impressed with this young man and what he's doing. And he's just starting out. Like he's just starting out. Uh, so amazing. Um the other thing that I saw at Gopher Khan uh in India was a talk by Matt Ellis. Um and you know, next to um, Stabby's talk, Sean Kelly gave an amazing talk on uh, on interfaces. Matt um, did a talk on a product he's working on called uh, Flogo, uh, Flogo.io. They call it an ultra light edge microservices framework, but it's, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but my impression was like, oh my God, I mean, a, a business dev person with just a little bit of programming skills could actually build out integrations and little web services on this thing. It's, it was really impressive with what they built and they created a plugin environment so you could add anything. I mean, they've already got stuff for like sending texts and, and, and these types of things. Anyway, you got to look at it because it was mind blowing what he was showing me and the UIs were all there. And I think it's going to help a lot of companies uh, be able to move quicker on, on certain types of, of, of projects that they need to um, they need to work on. And like I said, you didn't need, necessarily need a, 
the highest end developers to to get, but your higher end developers could have plugins. Anyway, Matt Ellis of uh, uh, Flogo, really impressive stuff. Yeah, very. It looks very cool. Yeah, really impressive. So those are my two Go projects. Okay, so what is this thing about automation that I have here on the notes? So I'm in I'm in India, right? I'm 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 watching the talk, and um, I have no idea how to pronounce this name, Carlicia. Niran John Paran. I don't know. Paran Japi. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely destroying it, so I apologize. I have no idea. Where he puts up a slide that says, "If boring, repetitive things aren't automated." A manager gets hired. And I, I see this slide and I'm like laughing and I take a picture of it and I, and I send it out in a tweet. All right. Well, since I sent that tweet out, I've had almost 123, a little over 123,000 impressions on this tweet with like 8,000 people engaging on it. I, I've never had a tweet that's had this much activity. This idea um, this idea has resonated with so many people that I, I just found it super interesting. Um, and then people had some really interesting perspectives um, on the tweet as well. But it's 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 kind of interesting, right? If we don't automate things, then you need to hire a manager to deal with all the people that you need to hire. I don't know. It's fascinating. That is fascinating. I and I just plus one that, so you have one more now. <laughs> I, I I never had a tweet go that. I mean, I'm, I mean, it's small, obviously, still, but I've never had a tweet go that viral and uh, resonate with so many people. So it was it was it was kind of fun to see. I actually I sent him a an email about it yesterday, and he was he was even like, "Oh wow, I had no idea." Now I want to call it a wrap pretty soon, but before we do that, I do want to ask you about uh, CFP. Submissions. Um, I know you have some tips for us, and um, conferences can definitely use uh, good talks. And for us to get good talks, the submissions have to be good. So tell us. Yeah, just really quickly, we, we need to see a whole new set of people come up and start speaking. I mean, can't be the same people over and over again. I mean, I'm sure everybody's tired of hearing me, right? And, I, and I'm really not speaking much anymore on stage unless um, I'm trying not to. I'm doing a lot of trainings. But um, in, in helping people and looking at, at submissions, um, what I'm finding is either there's just not enough detail in terms of being able to make a, a solid decision. And sometimes there's too much detail can hurt you as well. You've got to kind of have this medium where the reviewer can get a good sense of what this talk is going to be. Can it fit properly within the time frame, and, and can you deliver it? And Carlise, as you know, we have that document that um, kind of gives a really great guideline into preparing a talk and the CFP. Yeah, and the Dave Chinese recipe that we sort of put together. Yeah, yeah, stole. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, <laughs> And we keep, I keep asking people all the time. I go, people have these amazing ideas for talks. I'm here to help. Like, just reach out. I'll work with you on, on that document, and you'll have a very solid, um, very solid content to be able to submit. And I think you'll have a higher success rate of, uh, of getting in now that I've kind of been on, on both sides of it. And I just really don't want to see people hesitating. At all, uh, everything you're doing is is amazing, and the community should should hear about it one way or the other. So, so don't hesitate to submit a talk, even if you want to start with lightning talks. Um, a lot of times, you're going to go through the same process anyway. Yes, and people who have done talks got this, they CFP, their CFP uh, accepted. They have experience, and uh, but it's so good to see fresh faces. It really is. So we are we rooting for you, new people. You know. Get your talk, submit it, and accept it. And ask for help. I think the Go team on the wiki now has a list of people as well who are waiting for you to reach out to them. Uh, I think Russ Cox is one of them. Um, Frances Campoy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll probably throw that link out there too. Um, and those people have put their name out there 
because they want to be bothered. Like they want you to reach out to them. They will give you the time. So don't feel like you're bothering anybody. That's why their names are there. And, and just take the opportunity if this is something you really want to do. Um, Cause the community needs you at the end of the day. They need you to share what you're doing. That's a very good point. And with that, I would love to call it a wrap, even though I know we could sit here and talk for another five hours. Bill, it was so great to have you. Thank you. And especially thank you for joining us in such short notice. I'm just happy to be in Miami. Yeah. And you know, are you going to be at any conference uh, coming up? My next conference is GopherCon. Well, it's not GopherCon naming, but it's in China, which is um, April 13th through the 15th. And then after that, I'll be in the Singapore conference on, I think it's May 4th, May 4th. I'll be in Singapore. I'm going to go to Singapore twice in the next few weeks. I'm going to be in Singapore before the China conference. So, um, but yeah, so China and Singapore are my next um, conference. And I've got tons of awesome stickers. And I just bought a bunch of T-shirts from Women Who Go. Um, so if you're a woman in tech, cause I, I just got the, uh, the women fit shirts. Um, if you're a woman in tech and you see me at one of these conferences, I'll have t-shirts with me as well. Yes. That's a good point. Uh, good points, uh, all around. I did see that you have great Heptio stickers. Have you learned how to pronounce Heptio yet? Heptio? <laughs> Heptio. Throwing me under the bus again. There we go. Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> right, at least I think that's what, how it's pronounced. And yes, so there is an initiative to collect funds to send people to GopherCon, uh, people who otherwise would not be able to attend. So, and um, if you give you give your money, you'll get an awesome T-shirt in return. I got myself two. Well, one for me, one for somebody else. But the point is, the T-shirts are so cute. And... With that, I would like to congratulate the panel, which is me, Carlesia, and uh, all the listeners. Thank you, Bill. Um, and everyone, check us out on Twitter at GoTimeFM. If you do have any suggestions for future show, topic, or guest, go to github.com slash GoTimeFM slash pink. And with that, bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. All right, that's it for this episode of Go Time. Tune in live on Thursdays at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelog.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us. In real time during the shows, head to changelog.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at GoTimeFM. Special thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. Also, Linode, we host everything we do on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash changelog. GoTime is edited by Jonathan Youngblood, and the theme music for GoTime is produced by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening.